A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering chapter 18 from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms textbook. This chapter deals with diversity of microbial eukarya. Let's go ahead and get started. This chapter is going to be about uh, a general survey of eukaryotic microorganisms. Microbial members of the domain eukarya are much more genetically and ecologically diverse than their larger eukaryotic counterparts. The last common ancestor of all eukaryotes that was a eukaryote was closely related to the domain archaea. Do you remember from Biology 1406 that uh, the domain eukarya is more closely to, related to the domain archaea than either one is related to bacteria? So what that means is archaea and bacteria, even though they're both prokaryotes, uh, archaea are actually more closely related to eukaryotes. And this early eukaryote, this single cell creature, uh, this single cell eukaryote had a nucleus with spliceosomal enzymes to remove introns. Remember, prokaryotes do not possess introns. They do not conduct spliceosome or splicing of introns, I should say. The genome of this eukaryote had introns. This early eukaryote had mitochondria. So how did the mitochondria come to be? Do you guys remember the endosymbiont theory? Um, the endosymbiosis theory that, let me show you this real quick, that primary endosymbiosis led to uh, the formation of the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Do you recall that? There's a lot of evidence for this theory uh, that your mitochondria and plants' mitochondria and chloroplasts originally came from bacteria once upon a time. Uh, and the reason for this is pretty straightforward. There are so many pieces of evidence. Let me list off a few. Your mitochondria and plant chloroplasts have circularized DNA, one chromosome of circularized DNA, just like uh, bacteria do. On that circularized DNA are genes, and those genes code for things like ATP synthase, the electron transport chain, and a host of other genes that are very similar in sequence when you do sequence analysis to bacterial genes. Additionally, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts contain ribosomes, and these are ribosomes that uh, are closely related to prokaryotic ribosomes. It, even drugs that affect uh, the ribosomes of bacteria and uh, the drugs that are designed to be antibiotics, even those can sometimes cross over and damage the ribosomes or block the ribosomes of your mitochondria. Next, uh, mitochondria aren't produced by the cell. The way you get more mitochondria is one mitochondria copies its genome and there it undergoes a form of binary, uh, bi binary fission to form two cells. Just like a bacteria cell divides, mitochondria and chloroplast divide. Uh, there's uh, two membranes inside of a mitochondria so that suggests that an uh, endosymbiotic event, a, a vesicle was formed when the bacterium was ingested. Uh, so I talked about the ribosomes. Oh, the, the, way, the way the mitochondria conduct cellular respiration and the way the chloroplasts conduct photosynthesis, these are very similar, if not identical, to ways that bacteria conduct those very same processes. 
so I'll, I'll think of more examples as we go because there are other examples as well. But just, just think about that. It's very interesting to think that the mitochondria that reside in each one of your cells originally uh, came from an early bacterial uh, species that was endo, uh, engulfed or endosymbiotic event occurred to bring in that bacterial cell. It's really, really interesting stuff. So yeah, the endosymbiotic hypothesis or theory now is a foundational concept in modern cell biology that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once these free living organisms that were taken up by an early eukaryote. And then over time, what's happened is through genomic reduction, those mitochondria and chloroplasts uh, have lost genes that they no longer need. So they've lost their ability to grow independently of our cells. And they've focused mainly on those genes that they need to produce ATP for us. So it's a truly mutualistic symbiotic uh, relationship that has that has uh, see, bonded itself and and now we we, we rely on one another we cannot uh, independently exist any longer so I told you about a bunch of this evidence for this endosymbiosis theory let's see if I missed anything mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own circularized chromosome remember human chromosomes and animal chromosomes are linear Eukaryotic chromosomes are linear. Only prokaryotes have a circularized chromosome. Eukaryotic nuclei contains genes derived from bacteria. This is a fascinating finding. I didn't mention that one earlier. Mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own ribosomes. And these ribosomes, again, antibiotics that target bacterial ribosomes also impair mitochondrial protein production whereas they don't have an effect on human ribosomes in our cytoplasm or at our rough ER. Molecular phylogeny uh, shows that DNA in mitochondria and chloroplasts resembles that of bacteria. I did mention that. So if you take a look at cells under the microscope, and these are cells that are stained with uh, fluorescent dye DAPI uh, and observed with fluorescence microscopy, you can see that the DAPI binds to DNA and this, this big, uh, uh, this glowing structure here, this large glowing structure is the nucleus. That's the DNA inside of your nucleus. And these punctate uh, spots, these spots are the, mito the uh, mitochondrial DNA. So you can see in each one of your human cells, you can see your genomic DNA, but you can also see the mitochondrial DNA as well. So, now, let's talk a little bit about the uh, prokaryotes uh, that we're, uh, sorry, th let's talk a little bit about the, um, the micro uh, organisms that make up the eukaryotes and how their endosymbiosis has proceeded because it's so different than for you and I. For you and I, we had endosymbiosis, we took up uh, you know, an early ancestor of ours took up a bacterium that became the mitochondria. Plants took up a, a cyanobacteria, that's, that means a photosynthetic bacteria that became the chloroplasts. But in some of these protists, you know, these single cell eukaryotes, weird stuff has happened. And I want to show you this. Uh, it's called primary endosymbiosis and secondary endosymbiosis, which is a, a novel concept to a lot of people. So let me, let me show you what this means. During primary endosymbiosis, an early eukaryote took up a cell, okay, cell from cyanobacterial lineage. And this became a photosynthetic eukaryote, right, an early photosynthetic eukaryote and judging by the flagella and the shape of this early eukaryote this is a single cell uh, eukaryote this is a single cell organism and uh, it would have the uh, nucleus it would have a mitochondria so it can carry out cellular respiration um, and it would have then its uh, cyanobacteria as well for photosynthesis then 
then these diverged these diverged their lineage diverged during you know evolution to red algae and green algae then this is the weird part there was a secondary endosymbiotic event where the red algae was then taken up and keep in mind red algae is a eukaryotic creature the red algae was actually engulfed by another eukaryote so you've got a eukaryote engulfing another eukaryote and then living inside and this ultimately resulted in some of the current day uh, prokaryotes the current day um, protists these are the staminopiles uh, we're going to talk about staminopiles ap complexins and the dino flagellates we're going to be talking about these in you know later in this chapter and you can see that these organisms have in them a chloroplast from the red algae same thing here there was a sec secondary endosymbiosis event that occurred for certain protists with green algae as well the green algae was taken up by early eukaryotic cell which then led to the uh, you know the rise of euglenids euglenids and the chlor chlorarinophytes chlorachneophytes i'm sorry chlorachneophytes these ones are strange uh but do you guys see what happened here the protists are very strange not only did you have the primary endosymbiotic event once upon a time in history where a you know the, the mitochondria and the chloroplast were taken up prokaryotic cells were taken up uh, and became the mito mitochondria and the chloroplast however uh, you also had a secondary endosymbiotic event where eukaryotic eukaryotic photosynthesizers were taken up and uh, led to um, a symbi mutualistic symbiotic relationship over time. And we're going to be talking about these. So let's talk about these, uh, uh, these types of microorganisms that are eukaryotic. There are currently six recognized supergroups of eukaryotic microorganisms, or of eukarya in general. Um, and the molecular phylogeny is still being refined refined so you can see that um, there is no one phyla of eukaryotic microorganisms they kind of spread themselves across all the different phyla of microorganisms uh, protists again remember uh, protists and uh, microorganisms that are eukaryotes are very genetically diverse much more genetically diverse than their larger eukaryotic counterparts and this is why we see in the phylogenetic tree of eukarya uh, there is six of those characterized supergroups here you see these supergroups and we find the the uh, microorganisms the protists spread across the different groups and these protists there are certain groups that they belong to the the protists include the group excavata, aviolata, straminopiles, rosaria, and amoebozoa. So we're going to touch on each of these, but what you should know is that these are different groups of protists. So let's start with the excavata and what I want you to know about the excavata. The excavata are diplo monads which means they have two nuclei of equal size have very reduced mitochondria so their mitochondria is uh, not uh, very substantial and the two I really want you to know about are the giardia int uh, intestinalis which causes Giardias, giardiasis, a common waterborne intestinal disease, and the parabasalids. Uh, these contain a parabasal body, lack mitochondria, but instead have a hydrogenosome for anaerobic metabolism. A hydrogenosome, by the way, is an organelle that that uses protons uh, as the terminal electron acceptor uses protons to pick up electrons as an electron sink uh, for metabolism 
So take a look here. This is Giardia and Giardia intestinalis as well as Giardia lamlia. These are organisms and you can see what looks, they look like they have little eyes, but those are those uh, di nuclei. Remember the, the, they have two nuclei of equal sizes. So these two are their nuclei of, of equal sizes. And Giardia, what you should know is that these are closely associated with travelers, diarrhea. Uh, if you've ever heard the saying, don't drink the water, um, or at least don't make, make sure that you have filtered your water or you are drinking uh, treated water when traveling. Um, the purpose is Giardia is, is a very common uh, a commonly uh, encountered microorganism from drinking water that hasn't been properly treated and once inside of your intestines can cause you know numerous intestinal issues and diarrhea so Giardia intestinalis, Giardia lamlia these are big culprits for travelers uh, sickness, travelers diarrhea so next I was talking to you about the parabasalids uh, and here's a photo micrograph of Trichomonas vaginalis, which is, uh, you know, it infects the urogenital tissues. And you can see here that this, this particular one has a spear-like structure called an axle style used to attach to cells. All right, next move on to kinetoplastids. These creatures are named for the presence of their kinetoplast, the mass of DNA present in their single large mitochondrion. This is, this is different because usually cells have multiple mitochondria inside. You and I, we have 20 to 30 mitochondria per cell. And uh, you know, to have one large mitochondria is an is interesting feature of these kinetoplastids. They uh, live primarily in aquatic habitats, feeding on bacteria. Some can uh, cause serious diseases in humans like the trypanosoma. So trypanosoma brucei causes African sleeping sickness and it's spread by the vector, the tsetse fly. Uh, another interesting one, which I'll tell you about, but you know, it, it's not listed here, is trypanosoma cruzi which is spread by the kissing beetle. And that, that thing can cause Chagas disease. Uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, cruzi cause Chagas disease, which you guys may want to brush up on because you know it's, it's, uh, it's uh, known for being prevalent in South America. However, there are cases in the United States now. So you may actually encounter it here in the United States. The Trypanosoma look like this. They've got these whip-like structure they've got flagella and they they can exist in the blood so you can see this is a red blood cell that's a red blood cell so trypanosoma are you know oftentimes found in the blood uh, this is true for trypanosoma brucei as well as trypanosoma cruzi moving on to the euglenids these are non-pathogenic and phototrophic. That means they can use light for energy. They contain the chloroplast. That's how they can harvest the light. And they can also exist as heterotrophs, uh, getting their carbon from you know sugars. They can feed on bacteria by phagocytosis. They can actually engulf bacteria. So here is an euglena, a very typical phototrophic protist. Moving on to the aviolata, remember the group aviolata. Aviolates are characterized by the presence of alveoli, which are sacs underneath the cytoplasmic membrane. These sacs may function to help the cells maintain osmotic balance. Okay, and here are some of the members we're gonna discuss, the ciliates, the dinoflagellates, and the AP complexins. So let's look at these ciliates. Ciliates possess cilia. Remember, cilia are short, hair-like uh, extensions of the cell, which aid in motility. You know, usually for motility, they beat, hair-like structures that beat. 
uh, the most widely di uh, distributed genus is Paramecium. I'm going to show you a picture of Paramecium, very interesting organisms which use cilia for motility and to obtain their food. They, ciliates have two nuclei, but not two nuclei of equal sites like the Giardia. Uh, instead, uh, they have a macronuclei and a micronuclei. During conjugation, two paramecia exchange micronuclei. This is a very fascinating uh, thing they do. And uh, some ciliates are animal parasites. So take a look here. This is a paramecium. And you could see very faintly, you can see the little short hairs, the hairs that coat this bacteria. That's a, not bacterium, I'm sorry. This protist, this, this single cell protist. And this is actually a... A scanning electron micrograph of a of a paramecium as well. You can see very clearly the with the scanning electron microscope. You can see the cilia surrounding the cell. The paramecium, very common group of uh, ciliates. Here is an example. By the way, this should be uh, italicized. I'm sorry about that. Balantidium coli or B. coli a ciliated protist that causes a dysentery-like disease in humans. The dark blue stained lobed structure is the B. coli cyst. Uh, so this is the B. coli cyst obtained from swine intestine is a dividing macronucleus. Here's the dividing macronucleus and this is a cyst obtained from a swine intestine. So moving on to the dinoflagellates, also a type of aviolata. The dinoflagellates, this is a diverse marine and freshwater phototrophic organism, uh, or group of organisms, I should say. They have two flagella with different lengths and insertion points. So there might be a flagella along the lateral axis and the axial axis. Um, some are free living, others are live uh, symb symbiotically with coral. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, dense suspensions of these cells are called red tides. I'm going to show you a picture of red tide. Um, some are capable of bioluminescence and emit light when disturbed at night. These are really cool to see. If you've ever been on a beach in, say, San Diego uh, during the diatom season you'll see bioluminescence every time the waves crash in the ocean you'll see they sparks up a blue luminescent light it's beautiful though they're they they can produce toxins and uh, those toxins can kill fish and cause human food poisoning and specifically uh, Fisteria piss uh, Fisteria piscida, pis, I'm sorry, I get tongue twied, tongue twied on this every time. Fisteria piscida is a genus of toxic dinoflagellate responsible for massive fish kills. I'm going to show you this uh, this microorganism in a minute. Here is an example of a dinoflagellate ornithic. Ornithocerus magnificus, that's a magnificent name for this aviolette. Uh, and this is the cell proper, this is the organis organism here. And this all on the side, this, this what looks to be like a fish scale, this is actually uh, a uh, uh, ornate structure that attaches to the organism, it's called a list. So here is the list on the side and this here in the middle is the organism magnificus this is the red tide I told you about that uh, you could see a red tide when these dinoflagellates are numerous and in bloom and this is uh, this red tide is caused by massive growth of these toxin producing dinoflagellates such as Ganulax. Ganulax. The toxin is excreted into the water and also accumulates, accumulates in shellfish that feed on the dinoflagellates. Here's an electron micrograph of Fisteria. I'm not even going to try to pronounce its species name. 
because it's a tongue twister for me. So here is your Festeria. And in C, you can see the fish killed by Festeria and the lesion that, uh, that of dec decaying flesh uh, it left behind. And keep in mind, if people eat the fish, the marine life that are poisoned by Festeria, um, then you know you could that could lead to human poisoning as well, like food poisoning. Let's talk about AP complexins next. Again, a type of alveolata. These are obligate parasites of animals, uh, so that means that they they are always parasites of animals. They cause severe diseases such as malaria, toxoplasmosis, and Coxido, coccidiosis, coccidiosis. They contain an apicoplast. An apicoplast degenerate chloroplasts that lack pigments and phototropic capacity. So basically, a vestigial chloroplast that no longer functions for photosynthesis. So take a look at these apicomplexins. Um, you've got the plasmodium phallica, falciparum falciparum plasmodium falciparum in the blood smear this is the this is the parasite responsible for malaria it is spread by the vector the mosquito and by the way vector means a living transmitter of a disease right uh, the mosquito is the living transmitter and the and the parasite is the malaria uh, causing uh, microbe called plasmodium. Uh, on the right, you have the sporozoites uh, of Toxoplasma gondii. The sporozoites function in transmission of the parasite to a new host. These are the sporozoites. Let's move on to another group of protists. These are called the straminopiles. These include the oomycetes, the diatoms, golden algae, brown algae. Uh, all of them have uh, many short hair-like extensions. Let's start with the diatoms. Diatoms you've probably seen before in pictures in your textbooks or in the lab. We, I know in Biology 1406, we take a look at some neat looking diatoms under the microscope. There's over 100,000 species of diatoms, so they're very diverse and there's a myriad of different shapes. They're freshwater and marine. And you can, t you can always tell you're dealing with a diatom because they look like they're made out of glass and they are made out of glass because they have cell walls made of silica uh, and these these cell walls are called frustules um, by the way the the way the frustule works is that it it almost looks like a petri dish there's a small portion of the frustule and then the larger portion of the frustule fits over the smaller portion as you know such as like a uh, petri dish right and, and so that's, that's the way the frustrule works. These frustrules can exhibit radial and pinnate symmetry. Pinnate meaning having similar parts arranged on opposite sides of an axis. Uh, so let's take a look at these. These are, this is a dark field micrograph and these on the right are SEM, scanning electron micrographs of uh, beautiful diatoms. You've got triangular shape I love this one you have star shaped uh, circular uh, you know this one here is an example of the um, very uh, what was that called pinnate symmetry here you can see in a you have pinnate symmetry two axes of symmetry whereas uh, I'm sorry, in B, you can see pinnate sy symmetry, pinnate symmetry. And then in C and D, you see radial or round symmetry. Radial symmetry in C, radial symmetry in D, pinnate symmetry in B. And then you can see the diversity of all of these too. You see, there's so many diverse. This one looks like a Star Wars TIE fighter. That's kind of cool. This one looks like 
I don't even know what that is. That's really interesting. Um, but they're so diverse. Remember, there's 100,000 different species of these diatoms. And not only are they beautiful to look at, but they're, you know, photosynthetic microbes uh, responsible for a lot of the oxygen on the planet. Moving on to the oomycetes, these are also called water molds because of their filamentous growth and the presence of uh, cenocytic or multinucleate hyphae. Their cell walls are made of cellulose. Okay, next group to know about, the golden algae. These are also called the chrysophytes. Most are unicellular, and uh, they're golden because of their golden brown color. Okay, why are, and, and their golden brown color is due to the pigments they possess, the pigment dominated by fuxoxanthin, uh, which is also found in brown algae. Brown algae and golden algae are rich with fuxoxanthin, the pigment molecule. So here are just some pictures of the golden and brown algae in A, you can see dinobryon, a gold, golden algae. Um, in B, macrocystis, a marine kelp belonging to brown algae. And in C, you can see ochromonus, uh, ochromonus a unicellular chrysophyte. Uh, again, the chloroplasts, the golden or brown color of the chloroplasts of these algae is due to the pigment fucoxanthin. So that's what they have in common. That's what gives them this beautiful uh, golden and brown pigmentation. So next we're talking about Rhizaria. Remember the group of protists, Rhizaria? These are distinguished from other protists because of their thread-like pseudopods that they use to move and feed. Uh, so let's move on to uh, for, uh, foraminifera. Foraminifera. These uh, form shell-like structure called tests. Uh, these are really interesting. I'll show you a picture of a test coming up. Tests are made from organic materials reinforced with calcium carbonate. So you can see here a foraminiferin. Uh, and this is its test. This is its shell, right? This is the, the calcium carbonate and organic material that formed the test here. What are radiolarians? Uh, radiolarians are mostly marine heterotrophic organisms with tests also. These tests are made of silica and they have radial symmetry. So you can see here the radial symmetry and you can see its test. Uh, again, calcium carbonate and organic material here of Nacellaria, Nacellaria group. All right, last group here we're going to talk about of the protists, uh, Amoebozoa. Yeah, and these are, you know, amoeba, essentially, terrestrial and aquatic protists that use pseudopods. And remember what pseudopods are. If you don't know, pseudopods are... Uh, then what was roughly translated to fake feet, plasma membrane uh, organisms where the plasma membrane can sh uh, move around and they, they utilize extending plasma membrane for motility. Uh, the reason the plasma membrane extends is because of microfilament rearrangements in the cortex underneath the plasma membrane. Plasma membrane can move out. These Here, let me show you a picture. You see? Here's a fixed point. The arrow marks a fixed point in, in space. This is your amoeba with its pseudopod. You see the pseudopod is an extension of the cytoplasm. And that extension continues out. You know, the extension moves out. And as the extension moves out, it will attach to the surface. And then the other end of the organism retracts. So. Here on the plasma membrane is, is expanding. Here the plasma membrane is retracting, again because of the microfilaments underneath the plasma membrane rearranging themselves. And this is how they their mechanism of motility. The amoeba can move around on surfaces 
based on their pseudopods. Okay. Major groups are the gym amoebas, the ent amoebas, and the slime molds. So let's talk about the gym amoebas. Free living, inhabit soil and aquatic environments. Move by amoeboid movement. That's what I was showing you here. This is your textbook amoeba called amoeba proteus. This is when, when students think of amoeba, this is the amoeba you, your mind usually jumps to, you know, if you think about amoeba at all. So you can see every six seconds, you're seeing the amoeba move this amount of, of, uh, amount of distance. What are the ent amoebas then? Ent amoebas are parasites of vertebrates and invertebrates. You can find them in animal oral cavities or in the intestinal tract. Slime molds, on the other hand, uh, these, are, these were previously grouped with fungi because they have similar life cycles to fungi, believe it or not. They can make the stalk with the spores on top, etc., as, as part of their cell cycle or uh, part of their life cycle. But they're not uh, uh, fungi. They are molds, actually. And they are modal. They can move across surfaces rapidly. Here's an example of the slime mold. Uh, Physarum uh, growing on uh, agar surface, and you can see it's a slime mold. And if you ever have a chance, take a look at the cellular or acellular slime mold life cycle because it's bizarre. They have flagellated. At one point in their life cycle, they're flagellated. At another point, they're amoeboid. At another point, they make stalks and spores, sort of like a fungi. So if, if you've been keeping track, uh, during different parts, they're single cell flagellates, they're amoeboids, amoeba, they look like fungi, they make spores, they disseminate. I mean, they're so weird um, and, and fun. But that's, that's the whole point of the protests. They're weird and fun. <laughs> they, they're definitely very diverse in what they do and how they look and where they live. Uh, and, they're, and they're definitely fun to learn about. But but these are the big group of microorganisms that are eukaryotes. And next we're gonna talk about the fungi, which are also micro, microbes that are eukaryotes. And, but, but before we do, let's take a quick little break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll be back to talk about the fungi. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back from Break Time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's go ahead and continue our discussion of fungi. And I don't mean this fungi. Yeah, I did it. I did the dad joke of the century. All right, let's get started. Fungi. So again, these are eukaryotic microorganisms, though most fungi are multicellular, forming a network of hyphae. Hyphae are these filamentous uh, cells, filamentous cells. And when you have a bunch of filamentous cell, it can form uh, a mycelium. If you've ever noticed how fungi grow, they, they have like a hair-like consistency to them, a fuzzy consistency. That's the mycelium. And the reason for that is that the filamentous hyphae all intertangle to form the mycelium. Fungi are heterotrophs, obtaining their nutrition by secreting enzymes that break down complex chemicals into simple components that can be absorbed. Uh, they are also called saprophytes, which means they break down dead organic matter. The hyphae extend above the surface that can produce asexual spores called conidia. So when you see these uh, extensions, these hyphal extensions above the surface with spores. These are called conidia. And different species of fungi have different uh, morphologies of conidia. Conidia are often pigmented and resistant to drying. Hyphae form compact tufts called mycelia. Again, this is the mycelia I was telling you about, the fuzzy looking surface with large surface area to volume ratio, well adapted to absorptive nutrition. So they're great at digesting uh, dead uh, organic material 
by secreting enzymes and absorbing those nutrients from the organic material. Most fungal cell walls are made of chitin. It's a modified form of glucose. Mycorrhizae help plant roots obtain phosphorus and nitrogen. These are mycorrhizae uh, can work with plant roots. A lot of plants depend on these fungal helpers in a symbiotic relationship in that way. So here we can see, see in figures A and B fungal structure and growth. In A, you see a photograph of a typical mold, the spherical structures at the ends of the aerial hyphae. So this is the filamentous hyphae, the aerial hyphae that stands up. And here's the conidia. Here's the asexual spores at the top. These are called conidia. Here's the conidia in this cartoon here, the conidia. Okay, and the conidia spores and the conidia fours. The conidia fours are the hyphal hyphae that stand up and the conidia spores are these asexual spores that disseminate, that means spread through the air. In B you can see, again in B you can see a diagram of a mold life cycle. The conidia can be dispersed by either wind or animal. So you see here the conidia spores disseminate by wind or animal. They settle somewhere and germinate. That means they out the outgrowth. Then they the cells are filamentous and they grow with hyphal uh, morphology. The hyphae can then grow, form a mycelium, and then you can have aerial aerial uh, hyphae with conidiophores and conidiospores, and again to repeat the fungal life cycle. Here in a, a figure 18.20, you see colonies of Aspergillus species, which is a type of ascomycete growing on agar. You see this is what the colony of Aspergillus looks like on an agar plate. This would be individual uh, clonal populations, clonal uh, colonies. Note the masses of filamentous cells, the, my, the mycelia. See how it has a, fu a fuzzy, a fuzzy consistency to it? That's mycelia. And asexual spores that give col the colonies a dusty, matted appearance. So it almost looks dusty and matted. In B, this would be under a microscope. In B, the conidiophore and conidia of Aspergillus fumigatus, Aspergillus. You can see that the conidiophore is about 300 micrometers long and the conidia are about three micrometers wide. So each one of these little spores is about three micrometers wide. So it almost looks like, and I think for my class, I asked this on the, pra on the um, practical exam. You can see how the Hyphae is coming up and the conidia four, the conidia four and the conidia spore form like almost like a fan like pattern arrangement. You know, it fans out. That's a uh, very, t that's telltale sign of a aspergillus. Um, compare that later on to penicillium, which uh, the conidia uh, four and the conidia spores kind of all point the same way, kind of like. I call them finger-like projections. So with penicillium, the conidiospores all kind of point the same way. With asper aspergillus, you know, they, they kind of fan out in a fan-like pattern. So again, a major ecological role of fungi is to decompose. They decompose, so they are saprophytes. They, that means they, they get their nutritional value from dead organic material. Fungi are able to break down lignin, the compound that lends strength to woody plants. They're also uh, harnessed, their ability may be harnessed by the biofuel industry to break down woody plants prior to fermentation reactions. Some fungi produce macroscopic reproductive structures called fruiting bodies. If you've ever looked at a mushroom or puffball, uh, the fruiting bodies is what you see. That's the 
macroscopic reproductive structure of the fungi. Fungi can cause diseases in plants and animals. Uh, when you hear the term mycoses, that refers to human diseases by uh, a fungi. Anything, anything with the prefix myco has to do with fungi. So uh, myco, uh, mycoses are fungal diseases. My, mycotoxin is, you know, a, a toxin from a, from a fungi. Um, uh, myco, um, um, let's see, there's other, um, mycology, mycology is the study of fungi. I'm trying to think of other words with myco in them. Um, but, but basically what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the prefix myco in front of anything um, refers to fungi. So anytime you see myco, that, that refers to fungi. Here you can see the fruiting body of a, of a mushroom. See, that's the fruiting body of a mature mushroom. Uh, you have, uh, let's start with the mushroom. So this is the life cycle of a mushroom. Uh, you've got the fruiting body with the, this structure here is the basidiocarp. Basidiocarp releases, under the underneath of the basidiocarp is with the gills of the mushroom where the spores are formed. The spores disseminate usually by wind, um, sometimes by animal. The spores disseminate and then you have spore germination, outgrowth, you have hyphal formation, and then you start to form the uh, fruiting body. And the fruiting body pops up and grows into a new mushroom. And by the way, if you've ever noticed, this process is very rapid. Um, mushrooms can spring up overnight. So the, the process of this, this uh, fruiting body forming is very rapid. Most fungi reproduce by asexual means. So there are three forms, growth and spread of hyphal filaments. This is when the, 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 the actual cells are growing out from a central location. Asexual production of spores. So then you can form spores on the conidia. And simple cell division. Yeah, these guys can bud. Yeasts can bud. You can see here, this is a yeast, for instance. Uh, yeast are not filamentous in what they look like. They are more oblong, right? Kind of semi-spherical yeast. And you could see that yeast grow by budding. So a smaller yeast cell starts to bud from the parent cell. And by the way, on yeast, you'll see these scars. These scars are as a result of previous budding that occurred with the yeast cell. Previous budding events. Some fungi produce spores as a result of sexual reproduction. How does that work? Well, that's due to uh, the fusion of two haploid cells to form a diploid cells, or when a positive and a negative hyphae come together, that can form a sexual uh, spore as well, called a zygospore. So you could have different ways of forming sexual spores in fungi. There are different avenues by which sexual spores are made. Uh, fungi, though, can make asexual spores for asexual reproduction. They can form sexual spores for sexual reproduction. And you might be wondering, well, if you could do asexual reproduction, why would you do sexual reproduction? Um, a lot of times, you know, organisms want to increase their genetic variability, so they will undergo, they will employ sexual reproduction. Also, if the conditions are bad, if uh, nutrient deprivation is occurring or other cellular insults are happening, they will prefer sexual reproduction to asexual reproduction. So once these spores are made, spores can be resistant to drying, heating, freezing, and chemicals. These fungi are interesting uh, with their phylogeny. They, are, they share a more common ancestor with humans than any other group of eukaryotic organisms. 
And the earliest fungal lineage is thought to be the chytridiomycetes. These are the most ancient of the fungal species. So you have the uh, microsporidia. Uh, these are the chytrids, the chytrids. Uh, the zygomycota, glomeromycota, ascomycota, and basidiomycota. These are your, these are your fungal these are your fungal species right here. We're going to talk about each one. So let's talk about the chytrids or the chytridiomycota. Again, these are the earliest, uh, uh, the most ancient of the of the uh, of the divergent lines of fungi, along with microsporidia as well. So you got the microsporidia and the chytridiomycota. Microsporidia are obligate parasites of a wide range of animals. That means they they're pretty much always parasites. These are typically opportunistic pathogens. Microsporidia have a reduced genome, relying on their host for key features of life. Chytridiomycota are commonly found in moist soil, fresh water. Um, some are colonial, some are unicellular. Here's an example. Batrachiochytrium. Uh, has a has been implicated in massive die-off of amphibians. You can see it here. Uh, here is your frog epidermidis. So these are frog cells, and here are the chytrid cells uh, invading the frog, the frog embryo. So here you can see, or the frog epidermidis, I should say. Uh, you've got the cells of the chytrid um, stained pink, growing on the surface of the frog epidermidis causing infection and disease and death of those amphibians. So they're, they're killing off amphibians. Moving on to the zygomycota. Again, what have we done? We've talked about microsporidia briefly. We've touched on the chytrids briefly. Let's talk about zygomycetes. These are very interesting. They include the common bread mold, Rhizophis stolonifer, the, the black bread mold. This is your typical bread mold a representative here. Um, so zygomycota in general are known primarily for food spoilage. Obviously, um, these grow on your bread, they grow on food, spoil food, commonly found in soil and decaying plant material. They are coincidic, uh, coincidic means, or cenocytic, I should say, cenocytic which means that they form multiple cells with the same pla uh, 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 cytoplasm, right? So the cytoplasm kind of flows throughout the cells. The, it's a multicellular hyphae with um, uh, cytoplasm throughout all the cells. All form zygospores. Zygospores are sexual spores where oppositely uh, opposite mating types of hyphae come together and form a sexual spore where they come together. I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Microsporidio, um, we can skip that for now. So we can see the zygomycota. Here is your bread. Actually underneath here you can see the bread and on top of the bread you've got the mold. And this is your rhizopus uh, Nigricans, Rhizopus nigricans, which is uh, a, a type of bread mold, and the stained mycelium of Rhizopus showing the black aerial sporangia containing a sexual spore. So this is these black spots are the sporangia containing the asexual spores. The glomeromycota, on the other hand, the glomeromycotia, these are a small group of fungi that have major ecological importance. All known species form endomycorrhizae with the roots of uh, herbiscus uh, plants. Um, now, these endomycorrhizae, these are symbiotic relationships that are usually uh, mutualistic between fungi and plant roots. The fungi usually provide the plant roots with uh, nutrients and they can also prevent osmotic stress from from affecting the plant roots. 
the plant roots in return for the nutrients can give sugars uh, that it produces. Remember, plants can produce sugars. So sugars are going to the fungi. Other nutrients, including nitrates and such, are going to the, pl to the plant root as well as osmotic stress protection. So you have this mutualistic uh, sym symbiosis going on in the plant root itself. Okay, N none have grown independently of a plant. So this is a obligate symbiotic relationship for this fun fungal species. Reproduce asexually only and thought to have played important role in the ability of early vascular plants to colonize land. So very interesting organisms. They, they, they are like obligate mutualistic symbiotes with plant roots. Next, we're talking about the Ascomycota. Uh, these are the sac fungi. They're highly diverse, include both baker's yeast and common molds, aquatic and terrestrial environments. They decompose dead material. They are also lichen symbionts. So you have, uh, here's an example of your, your common uh, baker's yeast. This is baker's and brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, cells are spherical to oval and they divide through budding. I already showed you a picture of how they divide through budding. They flourish in habitats where sugars are present. Sexual reproduction process called mating can occur. So here's your Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, cell and Saccharomyces cerevisiae will divide via budding. A bud will form, extend, and and, and form an a independent cell, leaving a scar behind. There are two mating types of yeast in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which I'll show you in the next picture. Yeast cells can switch from one type to another by a genetic switch mechanism. So this is their life cycle. It's very fascinating. Uh, yeast have a haploid or 1N life cycle. They also have a diploid or 2N life cycle. So they can they can continue in whatever life cycle they want. So uh, haploid cells can divide as haploid cells. Diploid cells can divide as diploid cells. However, uh, diploid cells can undergo meiosis, forming a spore sac called an ascus. The ascos spores uh, are haploid. Uh, each one of these, uh, uh, each one of these spores can, you know, break off into its own cell, haploid cell. And then through germination, these, these uh, haploid cells just grow and bud and grow and bud into more haploid cells. Asexual reproduction by budding and cell division gives you more of these asexual, I'm sorry, these um, haploid cells. However, uh, they can decide to mate. Obvi uh, opposite mating types, A and alpha, opposite mating types can fuse mating type alpha, mating type A, uh, fuse, and now you have a diploid cell. And then you, you see you have nuclear fusion of your uh, opposite mating types, A and alpha. You have nuclear fusion, so now you have a diploid cell. And then again, through budding, you make more diploid cells. Very interesting stuff. And again, why would you want to undergo mating and sexual reproduction uh, to increase genetic variability for yourself and then you know otherwise you can you can just divide as a haploid one end cell now let's touch on the basidio mycota these are you know these include your mushrooms toadstools rusts puffballs etc uh, these are also yeasts and pathogens of plants these can also undergo both vegetative and sexual reproduction. So here's your mushrooms that you know you're familiar with. Uh, in A, you have amanita, a highly poisonous mushroom. And here's the fruiting body. Remember the fruiting body that extends above the land to disseminate uh, the spores. B, you can see the gills underneath the basidio cap. You know the the spore forming region. The gills are where the spores form. Uh, the spore-bearing basidia. And C, 
the light micrograph of basidia and the basidia spores from the mushroom coprinus. Uh, so you can see the actual spores on the cap. Now we're done with our discussion of fungi. And last, last but not least, are the archaeplastida. The archaeplastida, including the red algae and the green algae, to finish this chapter off. Let's do it. So let's talk about the archaeplastida. These are another group, major group of uh, eukaryotic microorganisms. These are photosynthetic. You have the red algae. Only the red and green algae originated from primary endosymbiotic events, whereas the other protists that have chloroplasts were the result of the secondary endosymbiotic event that we had talked about at the beginning of, this, of the chapter. Here we focus on the red and green algae, a large and diverse group of eukaryotic organisms that contain chlorophyll and carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. They provide the oxygen that we breathe. So let's talk about the red algae, which are also known as the rhodophytes. They're mostly marine, but some are freshwater and terrestrial. The red color is from phycoceurthrin. Am I pronouncing that right? Phycoerythrin. I'm sorry, phycoerythrin, an accessory pigment. An accessory pigment. That's what give it the red color. At greater water depths, more phycoerythrin is produced by cells to better absorb the available wavelengths of light. So that makes sense. This is a pigment molecule that apparently is red, which means that it's not absorbing red light. Uh, it's absorbing the shorter wavelengths of light. Remember, shorter wavelengths of light are higher in energy, and they also protrude deeper into the water. So if you're deep in the water, uh, a red pigment is a better solution for you because you know the red light wouldn't penetrate that far into the water. That makes sense. That's pretty interesting stuff. Now the green algae. The green algae, also called the chlorophytes, closely related to plants. Remember, they undergo photosynthesis. Most green algae inhabit freshwater, but some are marine and ter or terrestrial. Can be unicellular or mu multicellular can have sexual and asexual reproduction. So you can see here a host of different green algae, just different types. You see the variety of shapes and sizes that are that are present. All right, and that's about it. That's what I wanted to touch on for this chapter. And remember, the point of this chapter was to give you an appreciation of different types of uh, eukaryotic microorganisms and show you the diversity and complexity of, of microbial eukarya. Uh, next, in chapter 15 through 17, we're going to be discussing the diversity of bacteria and uh, archaea, you know, the, pro the prokaryotic microorganisms. And so we, we're, we're going to see some cool stuff there as well. So as always, please leave any questions you have in the comment box below, and I will catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.